I'm Father Scalia. I, um, what do you know about the reason for this talk? Or the topic of it? It's about the even was murdered. It was, yeah. It's about courage it's about standing and standing up to support. people who have same sex attraction. Sta standing up to them? Or I was like, courage to uh, like not have same sex attraction. Yeah. Just so yeah. <laughs> Okay. So first of all, uh, the re the reason I'm I'm here is because I'm uh, affiliated with a, tr a group called Courage, which is an international organization. It uh, that it was founded to help men and women who have same-sex attractions to live chastity. Um, so I'd like to talk. I'm not going to talk really too much about the group, because, uh, but I, I'd like to talk more about uh, the issue itself. One of the big things that you guys are facing uh, that I did not have to face when I was your age, I mean, it just wasn't really, um, it, it wasn't a public issue, um, is the issue of homosexuality. And so, uh, I mean, it's in, in most of the music that you do listen to, but probably shouldn't. Okay, it's in, uh, you know, most of the shows and movies, um, uh, in, in politics, probably the biggest issue right now, the one that, that um, politicians um, are having the hardest time dealing with if they do deal with it, is the issue of gay marriage. Um, just, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, there, there, was, there was no dispute about it. Uh, last, uh, last summer, the Supreme Court um, overturned a law <laughs> that had um, huge, huge support in, in Congress from both Republicans and Democrats. Bill Clinton signed it into law, the Defense of Marriage Act. And so it's not that long ago that that, that, that was all signed into law. And then just last summer, it was, it was deemed to be, um, to be cruel and hateful and, and all the rest. So in the midst of all of this, the Catholic Church has a, a very clear and strong teaching uh, about homosexuality, but really about sexuality just uh, uh, in general. And so we are looking more and more unusual in our culture. And uh, it's important for us uh, to know what the Church teaches about this so that when we speak to people in the culture, um, your friends, maybe family members, uh, and when you all go off to college, believe me, um, this, is, this is one of the biggest things on campus. It's like, you must approve of the gay lifestyle. That is one of the most, one of the biggest things uh, in colleges now. If you do not approve of it, somehow you will be labeled hateful. So, in fact, a lot of what I'm <laughs> gonna say to you today um, in other circumstances would be labeled uh, hate speech. And um, uh, I, I mean, I know a guy up in Canada who, who tweeted, he, he sent out a tweet, in support of traditional marriage, and he was fired immediately uh, because of hate speech. So that, that's sort of the, the, the uh, environment that, that we're in and why it's really important to, to know what is the truth um, what does the church teach? Because there are a lot of caricatures uh, about uh, Catholic teaching, and, and there's a lot of ignorance about it, too. So, um, before we get into the issue of homosexuality specifically, uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to talk about uh, the issue of sexuality in general, okay? Because it's not as though the only problem in our culture is uh, sort of the, the, the homosexual lifestyle. It's not as though everybody else in our culture is um, sexually pure and chaste and moral, uh, and it's just this, this one element that is not. Um, no, we, our entire culture has a huge, huge problem with sexuality. Uh, so, what is the purpose? of human sexuality. Okay. 
All right. No, we're not going to say reproduce. I, I do not accept that term. Procreate. There you go. What's the difference? It's one song is better than the other. Well, reproduce can be done in a vial, too. Right? Okay, but, okay, but, in, but uh, somebody who's conceived by in vitro, yeah. is that a human person? Yes. Yeah. Right? So, so it's, not, it's not so much the physical manner in which it's done that it makes the, dis the di well, difference between like reproduction. Nope. Yes, but that's, that's too simple. <laughs> Animals reproduce, right? Plants reproduce. Do they procreate? Is reproduction the same as procreation? No. Reproduction is animals have within, within them everything that's necessary to produce another animal. But a man and a woman do not have everything within them necessary to um, create another person. What is necessary in order to create another person? You need the soul. You need the soul, and we can't make the soul. Um, yes, uh, procreation is, it has this aspect here, creation. Only God creates. Because to create is to bring something out of nothing. So at the moment that, you're, you, you, that you came into being, God created your soul out of nothing. And uh, at the moment of conception. So the man and the woman provide the physical, the, the material stuff, if you will, the matter that is necessary for a new human life. But only God creates the soul out of nothing. And so it is, it is man and woman cooperating with God. And so he is the creator. Um, procreation, it's, I mean, it's a term, it's not, you know, in our culture, it doesn't, it doesn't, it sounds, it sounds just like reproduction, you know? It sounds just like that. But tech, it has a very technical meaning. Um, a man and a woman do not create another life. They are cooperators with God in creating it. So, and, and so gentlemen, first of all, as regards our respect for women, uh, think about it. Within a woman's womb, God creates something that never existed before. This is the only act of creation that God continues since the initial act of creation at the very beginning. Everything else in the world is, created for, is, is made from what already exists. The human soul alone is a new act of creation, and that is done by God's design in the mother's womb. That should give us a great reverence for women and for mothers. This is why the instinct of men in nobler times than ours was to sacrifice their lives for women. You know, uh, who got off the ship first if it was sinking? Women and children first. The men would go down with the ship. So, so the first purpose of, uh, of hum human sexuality is procreation. Now, I'm not going to get into the biology of how that happens or the physics, okay? I think, I presume you guys kind of know how that happens, right? Okay, good. What's the second purpose? Is there any other purpose, I should first ask? Is there any other purpose to, to human um, sexuality? Okay, unitive. Well, marriage, but, but like marriage, like one man, you one got woman. It. You got it. Okay. You got it. So pre pre procreation and then union. Okay, and this is what makes us different from the animals. Well, another thing. Okay, um, that the the marital act, sex, is designed for these two purposes. And for animals, this is, just, this is just reproduction. And for most animals, this has nothing to do with it whatsoever. And people will say, you know, what, what kind of bird is it that mates for life? You know, it's usually eighth grade girls who go, yes, but the, you know, the turtle dove mates for life. Well, I, don't, I don't, so what? <laughs> most animals, you know, they're not, they're not having wedding ceremonies and, and they're, not, they're not exchanging rings and things like that. So. These two things go together. 
Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas makes this very, very simple but profound observation. Everyone wants to know who his father is. I mean, that's just it's true. You know, there's, there's nobody says, I don't care about that. Uh, this is why, you know, children who've, who, you know, who, who've been adopted, they, they try to find their, their birth parents. Um, and so these two things go together because the new life that comes from procreation has to benefit from the union of the husband and wife. So human sexuality is designed for this. It is, let me use a very important word, oriented towards procreation and union, okay? It is designed, uh, let's say, ordered towards and oriented. That's the direction in which it's going. The same, re the same way, uh, you know, your eyes are designed, or oriented, ordered towards seeing, your ears for hearing, your, you know, and, and so on. Every single part of your body has a purpose, right? The same thing with the sexual organs. They have a purpose. So one guy uh, makes the observation that in order to understand the human body, if, if you want, if you have, have the human body, you want to make sense of it, how to understand it, you can explain every uh, member and organ of the human body with, with just one body, by observing one body. You can understand every member and organ. Eyes, ears, nose, gallbladder, lungs, spleen, whatever else. The only exception is, are the sexual organs. In order for those to make sense, one person is not enough. In order for these to make sense biologically and physically, you need two persons of the opposite sex. Otherwise, they don't make any sense whatsoever, just biologically, physically. I mean, leaving God out of it. It's kind of a weird thing for a Catholic priest to do, okay? But I'm leaving God out of it. Um, so, all of this is just, this is not uniquely Catholic teaching, by the way. This is not like, like the, the Eucharist or papal infallibility or the Immaculate Conception. This is just a, an observation about human nature and what most cultures held for millennia. Any violation of these two things is unchastity. Okay, and, and this is where I'm going to start clobbering you, okay? So, <laughs> to engage in, in sexual activity without intending uh, procreation or, or, and acting against it, or without intending union or acting against it, is unchastity. Okay. Uh, pornography, which most, not some, not many, most men in our culture struggle with. Pornography. It's... It's an abuse of both, and it's it's and it's 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 feeding, feeding an industry that that enslaves people. Um, it's taking your money. <laughs> you might as well just like take your money and go give it to like the worst people you can find, because that's what pornography does. But it violates both because why? There's no union intended, no procreation intended, and it usually leads to an action, a sexual action of one person with himself, and so it's a violation of these things. Um, fornication, sex outside of marriage, um, usually procreation is not intended, <laughs> and there's no union. And so if it, the child who's born is born into an insecure environment and sort of deliberately made that. Um, now when we, turn, when we talk about homosexuality, um, this is another form of unchastity, homosexual actions. <laughs> they cannot procreate. You guys understand why, right? Okay. It's impossible for two men or for two women to procreate. Um, and, and that's why, in, so, so uh, in our culture now, we have homosexuals, couples saying, um, saying that they had, they, they had a child together. No, you didn't have a child together. You partnered with somebody else, usually by way of in vitro fertilization, to have a child, but it's not your child. 
That's it's, a, it's a biological impossibility. In California, there is a bill uh, being proposed, I don't know the status of it right now, requiring uh, health insurance companies to pay for um, in vitro fertilization uh, for homosexual couples under uh, infertility care. Infertility is when a man and a woman are unable to have a child for some biological reason. It's not infertility if two men can't have a child. <laughs> That's just called nature. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just impossible. But homosexuality also does not fulfill this one because the union that is intended is expressed in the sexual act and, 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 is, and is intimately connected to procreation. So the union of a man and a woman should lead to uh, procreation. And the procreation should be founded, should be based on the union. So that in short, you know, sort of um, in, in very simple terms, is why the church teaches against um, uh, homosexual behavior. Because it, it violates bo both of those things. It's like um, uh, it, it departs from the design and the order and the orientation of human sexuality. And I want you to, especially this word right here, oriented, because you hear a lot in our culture about orientation. I don't have Facebook. Uh, I don't have a Facebook page, I know. I sound like an old man when I say, I don't have the Facebook. Okay. Um, I don't have a Facebook page. I don't think anybody should. I think it's kind of stupid. Um, but but uh, good, you shouldn't. Um, but from what I understand, you can like post your orientation. Human sexuality already has an orientation. Man to woman, woman to man. Physically, biologically, we already know this. And the church simply says, what we see in the human body, the parts that go together, that indicates something very, very true, very profound. Um, Another point about that word orientation, if something is oriented, it, it, it can't have more than one orientation. That's impossible. What is the orient? The east. It's the east, right? Oh, the, the word, oh. okay, do most or all of you take Latin? Is there a Latin class offered here? Okay, all right, this, this, is, this is another, uh, I think, probably much, much more pressing issue. Why there's no, not more Latin here. Anyway, oriens means, uh, the, the, the term orient, which means east, it, it comes from the Latin word for oriens, means rising, because it's describing the rising sun. The east is where the sun rises. You can't have more than one orient, because the sun can't rise in more than one place. You can't have more than one orientation, either Human sexuality is designed for a certain purpose, or it's not. And all we say is, there is this design that a whole lot of scientists have, have observed, and we say that this scientific biological fact has moral implications. So, um, question? No. Okay. Uh, no, I guess I didn't uh, look like you were... Okay, um, what does the church teach then uh, specifically about uh, homosexuality, uh, people who have homosexual inclinations and so on? You all right? Okay. The church teaches that same-sex attractions are not wrong, but acting on those Okay. Yes and no. Okay. Let's so this this is this is a very good start. So I put up here the term same sex attractions. In our culture they use the, the term homosexuality or gay, lesbian. Um 
This is kind of a more difficult, gay, one syllable, one word, three, three letters, very, very easy. Same sex attractions, three words, a whole, you know, more syllables, or whatever else, right? It's not as easy. Um, one of the reasons I use this term is because uh, we don't want to label a person just according to their, um, uh, according to their sexual uh, desires. That wouldn't be fair to anybody. Another reason is there's no such, there's, there's no like one description or one definition of somebody who's gay. So for the past almost 10 years, uh, I've, I've been working with men and women who have same-sex attractions. Some of them have been in relationships and have been in the lifestyle. Some of them um, should be dead of AIDS a long time ago based on the promiscuity of the lifestyle. Uh, some of them have never ever been in a relationship with a person of the same sex. So there, there's this huge spectrum. There's not one category, okay? What I'd like to do in order to sort of bring out what, what what's your name? Chris. What, what Chris said is to talk about uh, three different levels or layers uh, in, in, this, uh, in this issue. So the first is um, the attractions. So some people are attracted sexually to members of the same sex. Just a fact. Okay. Um, you notice that everybody's attracted to members of the same sex? Everybody. Um, it's called friendship. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, it's called friendship. Uh, a guy said to me one time, he said, Father, I, I'm, I'm attracted to men. I said, yeah, I am too. <laughs> like Super Bowl Sunday, I'm, I'm looking forward to hanging out with the guys, you know, and, and watching the football game. Uh, I look forward to speaking to close friends. I like to, you know, go fishing with the guys and, um, and so on. What we're talking about here is erotic sexual attraction, okay? Which really is a distortion of what is a good attraction. Okay? We, men should have good, healthy friendships. Men should uh, be close, uh, be intimate, which in our culture now only means one thing, right? Uh, but really, it, be intimate in the sense of being able to share their thoughts uh, with one another, uh, share even their feelings with one another. If you, you, you look at some of the, the greatest authors and greatest figures in history, they had some, you know, these men who, who had very close friends. Uh, it's extraordinarily important. But what we're talking about here are, are sexual attractions. What does the church teach about the attractions? All right. I'm getting a little technical here. All right. But you guys, the whole disordered procreation discussion, you showed yourselves capable of this. So. The phrase that is used is intrinsically disordered. Okay, now raise your hand if you heard me say that homosexuals are intrinsically disordered. Is that what you heard me say? <laughs> All right. uh, of course, okay, I didn't say that. The Catholic Church is accused of teaching that. It's not what the Church teaches. We do not say that anybody is intrinsically disordered. And there are good Catholics who get this wrong. Um, the teaching is that the attractions themselves are disordered. Why? Because they're not lined up in the correct direction. And when we say that they're intrinsically, I'm sorry, ah! I used to joke with people that I give this talk so often I could give it in my sleep. Apparently not. So they are objectively disordered, meaning uh, this is not a statement about the person's moral goodness. 
This is not a statement about guilt. This is simply a statement about uh, the, um, how these desires or attractions line up with what is true about the person, about the human person. Yeah. Are you saying about this is what the church thinks, or are you saying like this is what people say or what the church thinks? This is what the church teaches. Okay, I'm just yeah. clarifying. Yeah. That, that, um, so somebody comes to me and says, uh, I have same-sex attractions. I am sexually attracted to other men. That guy could be the same. Those attractions are still disordered, objectively. That's not a, that's not a statement about what, how good he is. He could be, you know, holiest guy around. And, and that's the thing, in, in working with this, with this group, in meeting with, with men and women uh, with homosexual inclinations, I encounter a lot of them who are very, very holy. Uh, and actually, they're holy uh, because they're struggling against this. And they're saying, you know what? I, I, I really need to lean on Christ more. So that's what the church teaches about the attractions. This is not a statement about the person's moral guilt or culpability. It's just simply a statement about the, about the, the, the attractions or what St. Thomas calls the passions. Another way of thinking about this is uh, if you uh, are inclined to anger, okay, and, and you, you got a temper, right? <laughs> and you're, you're inclined to just oh, fly off the handle. Does that make you wicked? No. No. But giving into it does. So they say that uh, St. Francis de Sales, the underside of his desk was clawed out. It was like scratched out. St. Francis de Sales is known for being gentle and kind and peaceful. He has a great line, you know, you attract more bees by honey than, than by vinegar. Um, the girls are having a whole lot more fun than we are, by the way, right? Sis, Sister Claire is much rowdier than I am. Um, but St. Francis de Sales, even though he's known for his gentleness, that's not what, that's not, that wasn't his, his temperament, as we call it. He was actually, <laughs> he really struggled with anger. And so imagine, like, he's meeting with somebody, and he's just, like, trying to control his anger and being very, very gentle. And the whole time, he's clawing out the desk, like, going, ah, oh, it's driving me crazy. So, um, so having the anger itself is not a sin. Giving into it is. The attractions themselves is not a sin, but they are still disordered. So that, Chris, is going to be the little sort of uh, correction that I would make to your summary of it, which was, I think, uh, accurate, except for this. The attractions are wrong, because sexual attractions aren't meant to go in that direction. But that doesn't make them a sin. Okay, you see, there's a difference between things being wrong and being a sin. If I'm inclined to drink too much, that's wrong. But if I resist it, well, it's not a sin. Okay? If you are attracted, if, if a stunningly beautiful woman walks into the room and you notice her, that's not a sin. <laughs> okay? If you're attracted to her, that's not a sin. Okay? In fact, it's not even wrong. <laughs> That's a, that's a great example. That one's not even wrong. Okay, so that's first, the attraction. Any questions? Comments, criticisms? I'm kidding about the second two. I'm not taking any. Okay. All right. And actually, I should have uh, reversed the order of these two. So, when we talk about homosexual actions, the church uses the term... And by the way, these terms are very unpopular, mainly because they're not explained. Um, the church teaches, and when I say the church teaches, it sounds like the Catholic Church invented this. No, the, like, if, if the Catholic Church says um, that, that, that water 
you know, <laughs> the, the water goes downhill. <laughs> that doesn't become a Catholic teaching. It's just the Catholic Church saying something that is true. And that's the case with these things. It's just the church saying what is true. And you don't have to be Catholic. You don't have to be Christian. You don't have to even believe in God in order to figure these things out. It helps, but it's not necessary. What do we believe about the, the actions are intrinsically disordered? Notice, as I said before, did I say the person? No. The person is not intrinsically disordered. No person is intrinsically disordered. It is the actions. What does this mean? What does the disordered part mean? It, it doesn't arrive at it. It's, it. it's not arriving at its destination. Can you think of some other things, some other um, actions that are disordered? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I don't know, being a glutton. Okay. Like, eating way too much. Right. Gluttony. What's that? Anger. Okay, this is, this is really good. These are two good examples. Is, are gluttony and wrath, is eating too much or getting anger, are these two things intrinsically disordered? No, because there is such a thing as healthy eating, right? And there is such a thing, believe it or not, as healthy anger, okay? So at times they could be disordered in certain circumstances, okay? Um, if, you know, if you've just eaten at noon and then at three you, you, you eat three pizzas, right? Okay. That's disordered, <laughs> okay? But if you haven't eaten for days, and then, and then you have three pizzas, you know, probably, still probably not healthy, but it's a different kind of thing. Uh, if I get angry at you because you're wearing gray shoes and I just haven't seen gray shoes, okay? Uh, that's kind of weird that I would do that, right? And it's probably sort of disordered if I start throwing furniture around and everything like that, and breaking the place up because you're wearing gray shoes. That's weird. But if I get angry at you because um, you insult my mother, well, that's, that's justified. Okay, so don't. All right, good. Um, lying. Lying is disordered. In fact, lying is intrinsically disordered. There are no circumstances that can make it right. Really? Which is a huge, huge issue. We can talk about that later. But, but, what? No, stop it. <laughs> no, that's a huge debate. I'm throwing that, that, that one out. But, but um, and again, in um, sexual morality, uh, contraception. Contraception's disordered. And, there, and um, abortion. Under what circumstances would abortion be okay? Nope. Never. Never. Yeah, but, but good. isn't there like a double effect? Like if it's no, right, okay, when you're talking about the principle of double effect, that's a different issue. Right, but that is no longer a direct abortion. What we're talking yeah, about is what, what we call direct abortion, I think it's probably what you're referring to as well. A direct abortion in which I am going to kill this child. Oh, no. Because you cannot do evil to achieve good, right? Or put another way, when is it okay to, to kill an innocent person? Never. Never. Sometimes it happens in war, but that's not the intention. So that, that is always and at all times wrong. It's intrinsically disordered to do that. Say the same thing about homosexual actions. That there are no circumstances that can make them right. Because, and what we hear today is if people are committed to each other, if they love each other, Whatever else? Well, no. No circumstances can make it right. Now, what if a man and a woman um, who are not married, uh, what if they sleep together? Is, that, is, is fornication intrinsically disordered? Yeah. Well, because no, you can do that under good 
certain circumstances if you're gay. They can get married. <laughs> right? So, so in order to make it right, they get married and they have the proper intentions and everything, and suddenly what in another circumstance was wrong now is right. And not only right, but sacred. But with homosexual actions, no. It, it, no, no amount of love, commitment, whatever else can, can ever make it right. Okay? That's what we mean by intrinsically, that the actions in themselves are wrong. Okay? Did I just say that homosexuals in themselves are wrong? No. 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 Did I say that they're intrinsically disordered? No. no. Did I say that you should hate them? No. Okay. Good. Right. So this is, um, this is what I personally have been accused of. Uh, this is what the church is accused of. And the fact of the matter is uh, this is just not, not fair to the church's teaching. Which brings us, ooh, this is a very nice marker. I'm going to start all over. Is that okay? <laughs> um, it, it, it comes, now we come to, the, to, to really the most important level of this teaching, which is the person. These other two levels are sort of the outer levels, and really I should have put reverse one and two. The actions are the outermost. The, the, those are the, the most superficial, what's on the outside. The attractions, that's more interior, right? It's something's experienced inside. But now we're talking about the person. What does the church teach about the person? No, what, 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 would, what would the church say about? Same-sex attractions. They're a person. She can look through shit as well as... Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. A person. Now, sometimes you'll hear, hear the phrase, uh, in fact, the church has even used it, and, and, but, but has gotten away from it, um, the, the phrase homosexual person. That's not a good phrase. There are only three kinds of persons. Not the Trinity, but you're, but you're on the right. Come on, you guys should. They're human persons. What other kind of persons are there? Spiritual. What do we call spiritual persons? Angels. Angels. And there's a third kind of persons. And there are only three of them. Divine. There are only three of them. Okay. So when we talk about the person, I, I think <laughs> they're just persons. We don't want to say, well, that's okay, that's a gay person, that's a straight person, that's a, and no, a person who might experience certain attractions, but that doesn't define the person. It's a very unfair thing to do to define a person that way. Very unfair. Now, the problem is that in our culture, more and more uh, in the homosexual um, sort of lifestyle, want to be defined that way. And uh, especially in the work of Courage, our work is to say, no, no, that is something that you experience, maybe very deeply, which is why you think it's who you are, but it shouldn't define you. Uh, and I, I've worked with a number of men who have struggled with same-sex attractions for years and, and at times would identify themselves that way, say, I am gay. Uh, and they have great freedom when somebody's there to say, you know what, you're a person. This does not define you. Because for years, they, they allowed it to define them. And so they thought that's how they had to act. Yeah? Um, what do you mean by, defi by define someone? Okay, so it's... Define, it's define. <laughs> define, define. Depends on what meaning of is, is. Um, Okay, that was for the studio audience. <laughs> and only one guy here who's going to really think I understand that joke. Anyway, uh, define, define. Um, well, there, there, be, there are those who say, okay, well, I'm gay, so this is going to be what I, what I read, what I think, what, you know, how I act, and things like that. Okay? Instead of saying, well, this is something I experience. I experience these attractions to somebody of the same sex. Okay, do you see the difference there? One thing is an aspect of, of who you are. The other is, I, this, this is who I am. Okay? Okay, 
so I think okay. So uh, I th all right. I think I so let, let's say this. I I like fishing. Okay, and this is this is a superficial example, um, but I don't define myself by that. Okay, um, as long as I can remember, I've spoken English. As long I, I don't remember ever not sp speaking English, or ever speaking any other language. As long as I remember, I've, I've only speak, uh, spoken English. Um, okay, that doesn't define me, though. An English speaker is part of who I am. It's not the entirety of who I am. And so same-sex attractions can be part of who a person is, but not the entirety. That's why it's unfair to say, oh, you know, those people over there are, are gay or bi or let's, whatever, whatever the term is, you know, that people are using. No, they're persons. And they might have a particular struggle, particular uh, experience, or, or, or feeling. But we're not going to label them that way. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so no stereotype. It's like stereotype. Thank you, no, thank you. No labels. Yeah, exactly. The same way we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't label anybody. I mean, this is, you know, Martin Luther King's great, great line that the man should be judged by the content of his character, not the color of his skin. That a man might be black. That's an aspect of who he is. That's not the entirety of who he is. Who he is. And we don't, we, don't, we don't say, oh, I see your skin color, then you must be this kind of person right here. No, that would be totally unfair. And so somebody says, well, I have same-sex attractions. Oh, okay. Then I know who you are, and we're going to put you in this category over here. That, that, that's not fair. All right, two groups that do this. You ready? Two groups that basically say that these two things are the same. That if you have the attractions, you should act on them. That is who you are. That uh, two groups that make the attractions equal to the person. If you have same-sex attractions, you're gay. Two groups. One. Uh, what I will, will just call the, the homosexual community. You know, with their own uh, publications and websites and churches and, and everything. Uh, and they, they'll say, anybody really, I mean, if, you, if you're attracted to, to a member of the same sex, that's really who you are and you should, you should embrace that and live it. Uh, and we say, well, no, that's not, that's not really, that doesn't define a person. And there, there, there are many of us who experience uh, things interiorly, feelings or affections, that we have to resist. Okay. The other group that does this, that makes the same mistake, that says if you have the attractions, then you are gay. I'm not even going to write it up there because it's offensive. But it's a, this group would be seen as more liberal. liberal. So all the way over here to the left. My left, not yours. Okay. Way on the other extreme is another group uh, that says, God hates fags. <laughs> Westboro Baptist uh, Church made this famous. Um, it, it, it's extraordinarily uh, stupid <laughs> and offensive. Most offensive things are also stupid. Um, and, but the, the they have, they have the same, they make the same mistake. If you experience these attractions, that is who you are, and that God hates you. Okay. That is not the Catholic position. A person, each person, each human person, are angelic persons created in the image and likeness of God? Yes, they are. The difference is that our image and likeness is embodied, is expressed also physically. Anyway, that's just parenthetical. The person, the human person, I don't even remember what it is. Oh, yes. Every, every person created in the image and likeness of God 
redeemed by Christ, if baptized, is made a child of God, is called to holiness, called to heaven. That's what the church teaches. So we don't say, oh, they're, they're sort of a rotten group and we don't want to have anything to do with them. No, this is, this is a group of people who experience certain attractions, certain struggles, but they're called to holiness and we want to help them. And that's, and that's what this group is all about. Yeah? Now what if somebody on one of these two ends turns this argument back on you and says, well, then Catholicism can't define who you are if gay can't define who I am? How would you, how would, like, you respond? I don't know if this is kind of off topic, but how would you really respond to that? Yeah, I wouldn't say that Catholicism should define who you are in, in, in this in sense. This, yeah. um, what should define who you are is, is a child of God. And, and part of that is, is belonging to the Church of Christ, which is the Catholic Church. Yeah. But, but um, when most people hear you know, Catholicism, they think, <laughs> they just think an institution, they, they're not thinking more broadly. Yeah. But, but um, you know what this does, is this gets really <laughs> very nicely to the, how powerful baptism is. Baptism actually does change who we are. So uh, before baptism, we're just creatures. After baptism, we're children of God, and we're members of the same body. So we can actually define ourselves that way. I can actually say, yes, I am a member of the body of Christ. I am a child of God. In fact, we ought to like wake up every morning and say, I'm a child of God. And sort of strut into school. <laughs> you know, my dad's bigger than yours. <laughs> I have God as my father, you know, like, don't let it go to your head, okay. Yeah? Is it true that your priesthood would do the same thing? Yeah. That, that, that just as, as baptism changes, changes the soul forever, so does priesthood. What other sacrament changes the soul forever? Confirmation. Confirmation does marriage? Yeah. Is there marriage in heaven? No. Then it doesn't change the soul forever. But... It's really, really close. And if you read the church, like you read the catechism, you read other documents in the church, the church is like, doesn't leave what we call an indelible mark on the soul, but it gets about as close as it can without doing that. So, the, in one flesh, I, one time I went to, uh, a, I raced to a house, a uh, husband had just had a heart attack. And, um, and I got there right as the paramedics were taking him away. And the wife was sitting on the front, uh, on the front step and I've never seen such pain. And she, the, her crying and, and just the, the, the cry of her soul. Uh, they're only in their 40s, uh, which is not old, okay? Um, and, uh, and she, but I looked at her and I realized she did not just lose a relative, she lost part of herself because they had become one flesh. And so death for spouses is very, it is the, the breaking part of one flesh. So, um, okay, so good question. Daniel. Daniel, thank you, okay. Other questions? All right. Let me say a word about words, uh, and then um, about uh, causes. So first, a word about words. Watch your language, okay? I mean, in general, you should watch your language. But also on this issue, um, don't use the word orientation unless you're talking about man to woman, woman to man. There's only one orientation for human sexuality. Anything apart from that uh, is literally disoriented. Okay? Either human sexuality is ordered, oriented, designed uh, for something specific, or there's no truth to it whatsoever. Okay? Um, the words gay, lesbian, queer, bisexual, these are loaded terms. We should avoid them. And that's why we, have, we use the term same-sex attractions. Because you know what? There, there are, I know, I know men who are happily married with, with, with family who still experience some degree of same-sex attractions. It doesn't define them, but they experience some degree. Um, so avoid those words. Avoid... Um, insulting words. 
fag, call, calling somebody or something gay. You may not mean uh, to be making a statement about somebody's sexuality, but if somebody who is struggling hears that, it's, it's very damaging, okay? And when I, was, when I was in high school, that, that's the language that we used, and I, I'm ashamed to say, um, and because it, 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 if, if, if somebody is struggling with same-sex attractions, and here's other people saying fag, gay, whatever else, queer, that does not help them to come to peace with, with what they're going through. Keep in mind, human sexuality, this, this is a, an extraordinarily important part of who we are. Back to the difference between a, um, angels uh, and men. Um, angels do not procreate. That's extraordinary. We possess a power that angels do not have. In fact, in fact some, some suspect that this is why Satan rebelled. Is it, is it he looked at, that God gave us uh, the power to procreate and he didn't give it to, to the angels? And Lucifer's like, what you, like, look at me. I'm Lucifer. Like, you know, I'm the greatest. And those guys down there, that's like, that's like fleas having a power that we don't have. <laughs> you know? I mean, think about how angry you'd be. What? <laughs> you gave fleas the power to do quantum mechanics and you didn't give it to us? <laughs> you know? Um, so we, we have this extraordinary power. This is something very important. So, so when somebody's sexuality is, when there's confusion there or difficulty or struggling and they hear around them these insulting terms, that's very damaging. And I work with men who, growing up, suffered that, you know, suffered people calling them, calling them names. And, uh, you know, it, it was a tough thing and it, and it hurt them deeply. So. That was just a couple words about words. Uh, now, about um, causes. Something that, that everybody wants to, wants to know is what causes homosexuality? Okay. Um, uh, you might have um, already been able to guess that I'm a big Lady Gaga fan. Right. Okay, so, <laughs> thank you, Nolan, for the, for the okay, good. So you understand it's a joke, right? Okay, good. Don't want you, I don't want you going back to your parents and saying, did you know Father Squeeze? <laughs> so he's changed a lot. <laughs> so, born this way, no, 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 no. There is no scientific proof, or really even evidence, that people are just born with same-sex attractions. Uh, many studies have been done. They've, been, they've tried to establish it. it just, it's just not there. The science is not there. Okay. Um, the big question in this is, is it nature? In other words, are people just born this way? Or is it nurture? Are they raised this way? Is it something genetic? Or is it something in the environment? What's your name? James. James? Good answer. All right. Uh, James what? Clancy. Okay. Um, you related to Tom? Yeah, but not the Tom Clancy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, nature or nurture? And, and the answer is, yeah, probably a little bit of both. In my work with men and women, same-sex attractions, uh, I'm yet to find someone who says, yeah, my upbringing was wonderful and great and there were never any difficulties whatsoever in my family. Okay. Now, does that mean that everybody with difficulties in the family suddenly has same-sex attractions? No. no. So, there are certain things uh, in temperament, uh, in, in the genes that we've received that, that can incline us in certain directions or, or come to a certain result when they hit uh, a particular environment. So yeah, it's probably, you know, some degree of one or the other. Okay, the thing that we want to avoid is really simplistic solutions. Saying, oh, people are born that way, so therefore it's okay. Which is a crazy, crazy reasoning. Scientifically and morally, it's crazy. We also want to avoid the, the mistake of saying, well, it's because 
of this thing that happened when he was young. It's just, it's never that easy. Things are never that cut and dry, okay? So we want to avoid, um, avoid those. Okay, questions? Pope Francis famously said when addressing uh, this issue, who am I to judge? And people seized on that and said, aha, uh -huh. the Pope just said homosexuality is okay. Okay. Um, first, Popes don't change church teaching. <laughs> they explain it and they confirm it. He didn't intend to change any teaching. What he was talking about actually specifically was somebody who has the attractions and is trying to live chastity. And, and let's say it's somebody who's made mistakes in the past and is now trying to live chastity. He says, you know, who am I to judge? In other words, we've all got our problems. We've all got our little disorders. <laughs> um, who am I to judge if somebody else has this particular struggle and, and struggling with it and maybe sometimes failing? Uh, I'm not going to condemn that person. Okay. All right. There goes what remained of the attention span. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's for me and sister. Um, okay, questions? Yeah, right. <laughs> like with Krispy Kreme donuts sitting right there, the question is, can I have a donut? Yeah. What's that? that? That was your question, can I have a donut? No. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, okay gentlemen. Um, this is an issue that, that will be in your life and in your face um, in a way that it, that it just was not for me um, uh, in, in high school and college, okay? And there, there will be great pressure for you to, um, uh, to approve of the homosexual lifestyle, to say it's okay. Um, one reaction, again, one reaction could be just to give in and say, yes, it's, it's fine. Another reaction would be to say, to, to go to the other extreme and really to, to, to sort of, you know, to go in lockdown mode. Um, and that's not winning any souls and that's not helping anybody. Uh, the best reaction we can have is really a, <laughs> um, a one that is grounded in the truth, that, is, that, that really is seeking to love all, all persons. And also, by the way, is cheerful. It's one of uh, Pope Francis's funniest lines. He said, um, he, he talking about evangelizing, he says, um, we don't need um, sourpusses. You know what sourpuss is? Um, it's, it comes from an Irish word. Um, I, don't know what, I, I don't know what the original Latin is, by the way, that the Pope used, but um, sourpuss is, there's somebody wa walking around, looks like they're, they're sucking on a lemon the whole time. You know, just really unhappy, and moping, and it's like you, you, there's no sign that they have the truth that saves. You know, like, you know, I'm Catholic, you know. <laughs> it's wonderful, but I don't have to be happy about it, okay? So we need to be joyful, need to be charitable, and uh, always grounded in the truth. You can't love another person apart from the truth, okay? And so that's why all of this is really at the service of charity, of love, okay? Questions? Yes. What do you do about people who like refuse to listen to logic? You know, because logic, the logic. This is this is a great. Well, you know what? There's so many that Thank you. Totally deny it. Yeah. Uh, so if I were to do as I sometimes do, uh, like a, a whole day presentation on this, I would bring in. I mean, if we had had more time, I would I would have brought in a speaker, somebody who's been in the lifestyle, and who can tell the story, because increasingly, what's your name? Andrew. 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 What? The, um, increasingly in our culture, people don't accept logic. They don't accept reason. And I have, I've discussed this with people, and they've said, you're right, but I'm going to live this way. They've not, they have not disputed any of my logic. 
but they've rejected the conclusions. Uh, and that's a huge struggle. This is something that Pope Benedict spoke of repeatedly. Is it, is it yeah, I mean, it, it, people aren't accepting reason, they're not accepting logic. We, can, we continue to love them, we continue to be charitable. Um, I think one of the best things that we can try to do is to, um, to tell the story of people who have embraced the truth and have found joy in it, okay? So, but th there's no easy answer to that. What do you think was the uprising like to like make this more culturally acceptable? Like? Great question. What, 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 what produced this? Honestly, guys, this is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is contraception. That's the biggest problem. Because what does contraception do? When a man and a woman come together um, sexually and they remove the possibility of children, they also remove what makes their union distinctly male and female, distinctly heterosexual. It becomes just, well, initially the desire is just union without procreation, and, and soon they don't even have union, they just have pleasure. And soon they don't even have that. Um, that's the biggest problem. Because once contraception is introduced, then we don't know what, sexu that what sex is for. True story, how's this for true story, true story. Guy comes in to meet with a priest, the priest who had prepared him and his wife for marriage. And he says, he's, he's upset, he says, oh, Father, I don't know how it happened, but my, my wife is pregnant. What do you mean you don't know how it happened? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Only in our culture could that be said. I don't know how it happened. We have so distorted the meaning of sexuality, mainly by contraception, that we can say crazy things like, I don't know how it happened. So that is really, that's the linchpin. Once you removed uh, the, the teaching on contraception, everything just started to, to, to fall apart. So. What happens when contraception comes about? Promiscuity skyrockets. Second, uh, divorce skyrockets. Adultery. And the homosexual community looks at that and they see promiscuity, they see adultery, they see divorce, and they go, oh, and they see, they, they see couples having no children, and they go, like, we can do that, <laughs> you know? What, what's so sacred about marriage now? So, contraception took the, the, the sanctity out of marriage and, the, and paved the way for this. That's why I didn't begin with homosexuality, did I? I began with this. Contra, uh, because contraception separates procreation and union. Once you separate those two, everything's up for grabs. So, that's a great question. We're gonna end with that because it's such a great question. Okay, and for that, you get an extra donut.